How's everybody doing? All right. My name is Mike Kanan, and I am the COO of Stranger's Guide. We're an award-winning publication that commissions stories from local writers and photographers to build authentic portraits of place from Scandinavia and Tehran to Colombia and Lagos. Learn more about what we do at strangersguide.com or connect with me after the session. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers. Guy Raz is the creative force between some of the best known podcasts, including How I Built This, Wow in the World, Wisdom from the Top, and TED Radio Hour. He is the founder of Built It Productions and the co-founder of the children's media company, Tinkercast. Oren Rosenbaum is a partner and head of audio at leading global talent and entertainment company, UTA, where he spearheads the agency's emerging platforms division. Rosenbaum represents a variety of podcast networks, creators, and early stage companies, including iHeartMedia, Tenderfoot TV, Pineapple Street, Campside, and Guy Raz. Please join me in welcoming everybody to the stage. You used to have people clapping for you on stage? Uh, it's really nice to see human faces. I mean, I know everyone's saying that, but it's, it's unusual. It's still new to me. Yeah. Um, so it's great to, to see everybody here. Hello. Hello, hello. It's my natural environment. Getting, getting yeah, applause, getting I know. Yeah. Well, every time you walk into a room, I'm applauding. That's right. That's right. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. We're going to talk about um, a little bit about how I built this and what it is and where it's heading. And we're also going to talk about Orrin Rosenbaum, who's um, not only uh, my agent, but a good friend and somebody who's really um, been a pioneer in audio. Um, so for, just out of curiosity, how many people in this room are either making podcasts or part of podcasts or interested in podcasting or interested in making them? Awesome. So I think our goal, one of our goals is to, and we'll take questions later, is to make this also a practical session to talk a little bit about like, what, what we think makes a good show and how to think about making a good show, and how to think about um, you know, creating content. So if that's helpful, hopefully it will, will be helpful. We'll, we'll be here to, to sort of talk about some of that too. So We'll talk a little bit about representation, and, uh, and then we'll do some questions at the end. Awesome. So, uh, and I'm Oren Rosenbaum. It's nice to be here, and thank you for joining me. Um, I want to kind of zoom in on, on something and then do your whole story. So. What, why were you drawn to audio? You know, um, really in the, at the beginning when I started, because I've been in this, in this space for 25 years. It was radio when I began, right, in 1997. And for me, it was a way to talk to people. So I am like probably some of you in here, I don't want to make too many assumptions, but I'm going to assume that some of you are a little socially awkward. Because, <laughs> um, you, you know, a lot of us are. And, and I am too, by default. That's my kind of default position. I have trained myself over 25 years to be less so. Because I have to speak in front of big crowds of people and do live shows in front of thousands of people. And so I have to kind of personify that person, right? But it, but really, at, at my core, I'm socially awkward. But there was something about holding a microphone in my hand which enabled me to walk up to people and talk to them. And really, all I wanted to do, I think all, all we all want to do is to build connections somehow. We want to create connections between ourselves and other people, even, even, even those of us who are socially awkward. And, and somehow, knowing that I was, per, I, was, I was approaching people to talk to them about their lives and stories for a larger purpose, for a bigger mission, which was to tell a story to a larger audience, enabled me to do that. It was like this invisible shield that I had that enabled me to walk up to people and say, hey, can I ask you a question about wherever we were? And that's really how it began. And so it was a, just a mechanism for me to talk to people to tell their stories, which I found so interesting. And that was it. And 20 years ago, podcasting wasn't a thing. So audio, you discovered audio through radio. Yep. And did you approach it as a fan or as I want to create and be a journalist in this medium the way you just described? You know, it's, it's, um, I really wanted to be a, a writer, a print reporter. 
you know, that was where sort of budding journalists, what they did 25 years ago. You went into, you wanted to go write, write for a newspaper. And actually, um, I started out writing for the Washington City Paper, which is a local alternative weekly paper in, in Washington, D.C., um, and really learned learned how to become a journalist. I didn't study it. I didn't, I didn't do that in college. And but you had a passion for it. I had a passion for it. And, and radio, really, I, I kind of fell into NPR because I was a listener. I mean, I started listening in college. I didn't grow up listening to it. I wasn't like strapped to a car seat. There were no car seats in the 70s, anyway, <laughs> or seatbelts. Um, so I wasn't, didn't grow up listening to it in, in a right. household. My parents didn't know what it was. When I got there in 1997, they, they would always ask me, how, how's it going at the radio station? And NPR really at the time was more like that. I mean, it mm -hmm. was it was less. It, now it's much sort of more kind of diversified, right? Yeah. But that's really how, how it began. I, I loved it, and I I wanted to be part of it, and I wanted to use all those tools to create a story, and eventually understood that the story was being built in the the minds that headspace of the people who listen, and and that that was that was it. Okay, so we graduated from college. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming. Yep. Then uh, you wanted to be a journalist, but a print journalist. Take us through the journey of that through the moment where you began podcasting. Yeah. So I was a reporter um, and a, a sort of a traditional journalist reporter for most of the first half of my career. Um, and I was very lucky early on in my career um, Back in 2000, I became the East, the, the Berlin correspondent for NPR. Um, and it was crazy. I mean, it was a totally crazy, nuts thing to do because I was inexperienced, young, and terrified. And, um, and I, I felt that when I got there, and by the way, this never goes away because I still feel this a, a part of that way now sitting here on stage. When I got to Berlin to be the NPR correspondent in 2000, I was so scared that I had basically duped all of these people into thinking I could do the job. <laughs> that, um, and I, you know, I, 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 I was like vomiting every every night. I was so scared because um, I was so worried that they would find out that I was a fraud. Um, and that is actually what motivated me to work so hard. Right. <laughs> I was so scared that um, they would discover that this was a terrible mistake that they made. Um, and so. Basically, that, that was it. I mean, I began this career um, first doing some work in Washington, D.C., and then, and then living overseas for seven years. And it, uh, I, I mean, I got to do all these amazing things. I got to report from 60 countries. I got to cover four wars, the Iraq War, Afghanistan, Kosovo, eventually uh, Israel-Palestine. And I uh, went into television for a few years. I went to CNN as a TV reporter, uh, which was a... Um, a great experience because I discovered after two years I wasn't made to, to do television. <laughs> I wasn't made to be a television reporter. Um, and then I, I came back and stayed in the news world um, and eventually became a, a news host um, at NPR, of all things considered, on the weekends. Um, and, I, and, and so that was really when the transition, my transition towards moving into podcasting began and kind of leaving the news world, leaving the world of NPR, leaving the journalism side and focusing on, on what I now do. So would you say that you sort of fell into this international foreign correspondent war political thing, or was that a passion that was a, you, there was a North Star for you? I, I always wanted to, to go overseas. I think you know, you, a lot of us have wanderlust, especially when we're younger, and I, I wanted to, to see the world. And, I wanted, and, and what, what's, what's remarkable about being, and I, I'm watching the coverage in Ukraine now, and it's so remarkable because I know some of the reporters there, and remarkably some of whom I met 20 years ago who were doing that kind of work, and I'm just so just inspired and amazed at, at, at the courage you know, of, of what they're doing. It's covering conflicts is really hard. It's really exciting. There's a lot of adrenaline involved. It's, it's, but it's also, um, you know, there are, there are major trade-offs, and one of one of them, and what I discovered covering conflicts was um, the intention often for a, a reporter who goes overseas is to create, um, is to be able to to educate the audience at home, 
so that they understand what's happening, so that in theory, they will be more engaged and maybe you know, it will help to resolve the conflict. I think that is a, in the back of the mind, in the back of, of my mind at least as a reporter, I think a lot of reporters share this view, that's kind of what, what happens. Um, but of course it doesn't happen. And I, I found when I was overseas that um, I started to see seeds of, I think, of where we are now, which is you know, increasing polarization um, and strife. And so it wasn't that I, I it, it wasn't that, that strife um, turned me away from reporting. It was more like I wanted to, I think, and I think a lot of people who go into this profession, you wanna, you wanna kind of make an impact somehow, right? You wanna somehow affect the way people think about the world around them. And to me, reporting on the news wasn't, it wasn't working for me. I didn't feel like that was having the impact I wanted to have. Okay, so you get to this point where you're, you're doing all things considered on the weekend. Yep. And up until that point, you're, you're reporting, you're covering, yep. but you weren't then, at that point, really a creator. Right. In terms of the public perception and, and who you are today, were you always a creator and you just were waiting for that moment? Or when did you just say, I have this brilliant idea and I just want to make something? I want to make my own thing. I think all, I mean, I know it's going to sound like a cliche or maybe a bit hokey, but I think all of us are creators, right? We all have this kind of thing in, within us where we know, we may not know what the exact thing we want to do, but we know that inside of us there is something that we want to say or something we want to do. And for me, um, it was going back to this idea of connection, mm -hmm. right? For, for me, I was never, as a reporter, I was never good at chasing stories. I was never the first. I was never breaking news. I was never spending months and months investigating stories. All incredible skills that I just didn't excel at. What I really excelled at was finding people, figuring out how to build a connection quickly, and drawing a story out of them. And I began to sort of see that that's what I was good at. And so I used that, th that kind of those skills right. when, I was, uh, when I was doing news anchoring and, and really began to kind of experiment with what eventually I would do even when I was doing a news show um, with an incredible team of, of producers who I, uh, some, some of whom I still work with today. And what, if there is one specific inflection point or what was the catalyst that got you from being journalist anchor, reporter, to creator? Was there a moment? Was there something that happened? Um, there, it, I think it was an accumulation of things. It was like sort of around 2010, 2011, just beginning to see and understand political, the political polarization. Because I was living in Washington, D.C. I don't, I don't live in Washington, D.C. anymore. I now live in the Bay Area. But I, I began to see the the, the, the sort of the starker outlines of, of that. You know, there was a Tea Party and there was a lot of strife and there was a lot of kind of um, anger. Um, and it, it just didn't appeal to me. Um, <clears throat> the other thing was, um, you know, I, I had a, a really important failure that um, I'm so grateful for today and I, and I you know, if you ever listen to how I built this, I really try to focus on failure on the show. I try to really hone in on those moments when people just made a mistake or something happened to them that they thought would have ended their career. And I, I, I really focus on those moments because I want people to understand that failure in the moment is so hard. It sucks. And I, we all hate it. I hate it now. But it's also really important to stop and, and to try and and understand that there's a reason why it happens. Right. And, and oftentimes it can be a gift. So my gift was, my dream was to be the, the weekday anchor, like the main news guy, news guy. Um, I didn't do that intentionally, um, uh, on NPR. And I didn't get the job. So this is back in like 2011. And I really began to reevaluate what I wanted to do with my life and my career. You know, should I get out of journalism? I've been doing this now at that point for you know, 11 or 12 years, and should I kind of start again and figure something else out? And I really was looking around to see what I could do. Um, 
what I did know was that maybe it was time for me to move out of the news world. And at that time, um, podcasting was, it existed, but it was really kind of being developed uh, at NPR. Mm -hmm. And um, there was an organization that many of you know, TED, um, and they had approached NPR to, to collaborate um, on a show. And so I, I went for that to, to kind of be part of that. And, um, and that was it. That was, that was sort of my transition out of the news world into what, what has become known as podcasting. Right. So you saw this thing that was happening. Yeah. And then right around then, Ted had approached NPR to say, hey, let's do something. Yeah. And did they have an idea? Did NPR have an idea? Or was it, what happened? How did that whole thing? It did. Happen? And they, they had an idea. And they did a pilot season in 2012 um, with a different host who was really excellent, um, Allison Stewart. And she um, did a few episodes of the show. And they had a format. She didn't want to continue doing the show. Um, and so they had to kind of figure out what to do with it. And uh, around that time, I. I wanted to, I said, you know, let me, let me try this out and let's see if we can come up with a concept for the show that would be something different. Would be, you know, I was really inspired by Radio Lab and by This American Life. So one of the things at the time at NPR, there was a, a rule, a really hard and fast rule at NPR, which is you couldn't use music under, uh, under any, anything. Music was verboten. It was considered to be emotionally manipulative. Original music or licensed music? Any music, music. under, okay. under content. No music. OK? Right. And, and, and so my answer to that question was when people say, well, it's emotionally manipulative to use music. And I would say, exactly. <laughs> Have you ever seen a movie without music? Have you ever seen a documentary about the making of a movie when they don't have music? Can you imagine? It doesn't, you, don't, you don't connect with it. Music is emotionally manipulative. Exactly, precisely. Let's use it and emotionally manipulate our listeners to be strong, more strongly connected to this content. And that was, um, that was TED Radio Hour. We, we, we basically took TED Talks, and, uh, and I would interview TED speakers. And then we would use, we would sort of, with these brilliant group of producers that I worked with, um, we would craft these very sound rich shows. And it was designed to be a journey. You know, it was, it was really designed to, not to be about the day-to-day -day news, but about, Sort of imagine you're, you know, you're in an airplane, and you are flying at thirty thousand feet, and you're over Iowa, and you just see squares, right? If you parachuted down and you landed, you'd be in a cornfield. And then if you opened up that, you know, that that husk of corn, what's it called? The corn husk. Corn husk. You could look at the car individual kernel, but 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 I didn't want to look at the individual kernel. Only I wanted to get up to thirty-five thousand feet and say, actually, look at these squares, like, you know, and, and sort of think about human beings as as something sort of bigger than just events that were happening day to day. So, what that show allowed us to do is to explore things like creativity, the source of creativity, or you know, uh, imag or imagination. And, and then really looking at this idea, and it's, it's going to sound kind of new agey, I know, but I really believe in this, and believed in it then, and believe in it now, that humans, we are, we are a unique species, right? I'm not saying anything we don't all know. We are different from pretty much every other species. We share things with whales and crows. Crows can be collaborative, and whales can be empathetic. But there is no other species that can do all the things we can do. We can, we can be collaborative. We can show. We can. We are creative. We can imagine the future and the past. You, you know, you all know. Noah Harari wrote a famous book about this idea. We can imagine societies. We can create conferences. We are this really unbelievably unique, destructive, but also wonderful species. And so, could you do a show that took a species-wide <laughs> wide approach? Like, and what I discovered with that show was. But for the first time in my career, people were connecting with the things I was doing in a very, very visceral way. It was a really, it was a different kind of connection. It wasn't just like, today, this is what happened in, in, in Macedonia, or right. this is what happened in Baghdad. It was, this person is talking about how they discover creativity, or this person is talking about why our brains 
are able to collaborate, and that is triggering and sparking something in my head that's making me think about my life and what I can do. And that was really powerful to me, the idea that you could actually have that kind of impact on an audience. And so what I understood kind of, I think, implicitly came to the surface, and this is what it was. It was that there is a power, and I, I, again, I knew this implicitly, but didn't, couldn't intellectualize it. I couldn't articulate it, which is, and I think all of you who are in podcasting now understand this, audio, there's something about audio that is particularly unique because you can, you are hearing a person's voice and you're mostly hearing it through earbuds. And so it is occupying the space between your ears. You know, the inside of your head is my voice or whichever voice you're listening to. And so you can't but not create, was that right? You can't but not, you can't help but create a relationship with that voice in your head. Right. And, you, and it's a connection. And it's a one-to-one -one connection. So when I'm talking, I'm talking to you and to you and to you, and definitely to you, because we know each other. And that's what I'm doing. And it doesn't matter that a million or two million or five million, it doesn't matter how many people are listening. It is a one-to-one -one connection. And the other thing about audio that is extraordinarily remarkable is every single person's experience is different. So everything that you're doing on your show, on my show, it's a movie in somebody's mind. It's, it's, it's a, an animation, it's whatever it is. Right. And that principle is what I would apply to how I built this and my kids show out well in the world, whatever I do. The idea is everybody is experiencing it differently and it's a visual. Audio is visual. It doesn't sound, it sounds weird to say it, right. but it's one of the most, it's I think in arguably the most visual medium because you are building that image in your mind. And that takes work. And so your brain is really connecting to it in a way that it doesn't when you just read an article or you just watch a video. And that's really when I began to kind of understand and, and put all these things together right. that this was powerful. This was really powerful. And when did it, when did you go from, I'm making a podcast to I'm making a brand, I'm making an experience. And not only that, but unlike your work with NPR up until that point, this is a, I have to decide as a listener to click TED Radio Hour and lean in and listen versus this is just on the radio and I happened to be in my car at that time. Yeah. I mean, when I started um, with TED Radio Hour, it was like going into exile in 2012. This was, podcasting was a backwater. And I really was, I thought it was maybe a transition out of what I was doing. Because right. I wasn't, who was going to listen to, the, to this? Who's going to? And a couple things happened. Most importantly, Serial was a, a, an absolute game changer for podcasting because it mainstreamed podcasting. I mean, it was on Saturday Night Live. Mm -hmm. It was like on The Tonight Show. It was a big deal. And that show really kind of lifted the tide. Um, you know, f for me, um, I, I started to see with TED Radio Hour early on, just watching it, you know, watching, you could see, in, not in real time, but you could see how it would kind of emerge up and down the iTunes charts, which at the time we all already knew was not a great measure of what, whether something was successful or not, but it was still a measure. And it was interesting to see that and to see that it was kind of trickling in to, you know, the culture of, of, mm -hmm. of, of audio. Um, and I guess that was, that was sort of the, the beginning of it. And uh, I mean, one of the things that I tell my team all the time is to not, you know, if we're in the world and the space of audio, don't just think about audio as a podcast, as one, you know, little piece of content, but really just a brand. And to your point, everyone's experience is, is different when they listen to an episode. And for me, I remember discovering how I built this. And I was just sitting there and I, it was a movie. Every, the first three episodes, I just, those were the only three that were available. You had been, you created the soundtrack to a movie that I was making in my mind. And it's really, it was really special because it was unlike anything I'd ever heard. And so I'm curious to know, 
it seems so obvious now, oh, it's a produced conversation. But up until that point, it was just a couple people chatting, and it was just, you know, outlined at best. Yeah. And what, how did that, again, how did your brain think, I'm going to do this specific theme, this is the way I'm going to tell that story, and then I'm going to get these people to trust me right. to tell their story. Well, first of all, there were pion- I mean, there were already pion- major pioneers in podcasting, and some of them are hugely important and influential now, like Mark Maron, mm-hmm. Joe Rogan. I mean, they were making podcasts long before anyone was listening to them, right? Um, um, I can't remember his name, the guy who did the Revolutions podcast, which is Mike Duncan. Mike Duncan. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was there, right? The, the way I, I, I've, I've always thought of, not always, but certainly in the last sort of 10, 15 years, I've always thought about audio was, was very, in a very simple way. Is what I'm making worth your time, All right? You've got 14 waking hours of the day. That's, that would be, no, you have more than that, because that would be 10 hours of sleep. No one sleeps 10 hours. I wish I did. Um, you've got 16 waking hours during the day, and most of that time is spent working or doing things that are, involve your profession, right? And maybe two or three of them are free time. So what I mean by free time, exercise time, time to just you know, cook, time to do things that for you. And I'm asking you to give me one hour of that three hours. It's a lot, it's a valuable thing. That's worth more than money. And if I'm gonna ask you to give me an hour of that time, it has to be worth your time. And so what I wanted to do even though there were really good podcasts out there, they were very long, one hour, two hours, three hours. And, and what I know from, when I, what I've known from live television when I was at CNN is that there's a lot of parentheticals when people talk, even now, right? Like, I mean, I hope this is not uninteresting, but if we edited this down, we could edit this conversation down to 25 minutes, okay? Because we would take out things that were unnecessary. And I knew that, if I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna earn your time, I wanna give you really rich content, but I want, I want it to be properly produced so that we really eliminate the parentheticals and the things that are not necessary without losing the feeling and, and the emotion and the nuance because you can still keep that in there. It doesn't mean you cut out every um and ah and pause. No, you keep those in there. That's how humans talk. But we might go off on a tangent and talk about our you know, mutual love of uh, of, of pickleball, I don't know. Never played. Never played. <laughs> Love the and then idea. we would take it out. Right. Right. And so that really was how I started to think about content creation, which is how do you make something that is worth your listener's time? And it, it takes a lot of time to kind of think about what it is you're, you're making for them. I, I want you to, to, to the best of your ability, uh, dissect the, like, we were with someone you interviewed last night, and that founder admitted that they had done interviews in the past, but what they revealed to you, what they shared with you, was different. Right? No one had asked them those questions. No one had gotten them to say the things that they said to you. And the, you know, it's the truth. Many of the people that you've interviewed have done interviews elsewhere, but they always point back to, oh my god, my interview on how I built this was, that's the story. That's my story. And is that, what is that? Is that the way you put it together and produce it? Is it the questions you ask? Is it, what's the magic sauce? So the magic sauce is really, really, really hard work, right? It's not, a, it's not the most satisfying answer. But I think what's important about that answer is it, it tells you one really important thing. I am not a magician. I am not a talent, you know, more talented interviewer than you. I am not smarter. I am not, I don't have some kind of power to put somebody in a trance and pull things out of them, (laughs) right? What I do is I work really, really hard, even before we invite somebody to the show. So we do now, and and now how I built this is, um, it's no longer an NPR program, it's it's an Amazon Wondery program, we can talk about that later on, Um, but we do 45 long form interviews a year and then 45 shorter shows a year called How I Built This Lab, which will debut in April. The longer episodes, 
and I'm doing one tomorrow. Um, tomorrow I'm going to be interviewing the founder of Roblox, David Bazuki, and that episode will not appear on how I built this for two or three months from now. So the first thing to know is I don't care about the news cycle, and I don't care if somebody beats me, and I don't care. I've done interviews, and then I've seen in the New York Times three or four weeks later, and our interview is not ready to, 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 to be put out there. It just happened with um, Discord. We had an episode of Discord this week. I interviewed Jason Citron last year. There was a piece on the New York Times a couple weeks later. It doesn't, doesn't matter because we're not looking, I'm not looking to compete against other, con, you know, other media organizations. What we do is we spend a lot of time thinking about the, net, the arc, about the story, the person's story. And then we spend a lot of time reading and researching. So I go into every interview having done seven, eight, nine, ten hours of reading about that person. Because if I know their story so well, then I can drag, pull things out of them that I don't know and that they may not remember. It, here, here's the thing. I'm not tricking somebody into telling me intimate personal details of their life, right? What I'm doing is I'm triggering memories that they then talk about that they've never talked about before because they hadn't remembered those right. things. And you trigger memories by knowing somebody's story so well that you can kind of poke around. It's like, you know, we've got these, you know, these pressure points on our bodies. And if you've ever had like somebody try to, you know, grind them out, <laughs> you know, you sort of, you kind of, you move around a little bit, right? And that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm sort of poking around with a framework, with an understanding of the kind of the architecture of their life, but going down rabbit holes. And then they're like, you know what? I just remembered this person that I talked to about this. So, and so that's what happens. I'll give you a quick example. Um, I'm interviewing Max Levchin for the show, founder of PayPal, the CTO of PayPal, and really the kind of the, 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 the guy who put together the bones of what PayPal became. And Max Levchin was a computer science nerd who moved to California to see if he could start a company. And he met Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel uh, was giving a lecture at Stanford, and, and there were four people who attended. And Max Levchin was one of them, and he went and talked to him after. And they had breakfast the next day. And throughout the course of this interview, um, you know, he, he, he told some really interesting stories and details about conversations that he and Peter Thiel would have early on. And it's interesting because, you know, Peter Thiel, of course, is like, has kind of been portrayed as like a cartoon kind of evil villain. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a very nuanced kind of look at even their relationship. Right. You know, um, this idea, one of the really cool insights that came out of that conversation was when Max Levchin started a firm, which is his company that, that he has now, the, the um, you know, sort of layaway plan company that has been very successful, it started with the concept that he got from conversations with Peter Thiel, which is if you want to build something valuable, it has to be hard. Because if, if it wasn't hard, everybody would do it. If, if you could build something valuable that wasn't hard to make, everybody would replicate it. So he starts with this premise that he needs to solve a hard problem to build a valuable company. But in order for him to want to do it, it has to be fun. Hard, valuable, fun. And that was, that's what led to a firm. Um, so. I want to shift over to the business side of audio and, and for you, because it, at no point did you mention, oh, I saw the money, right? Oh, I did it for the money. Right. And I think one of the things that I'm blessed you know, as a representative is the creators, the talent that I work with and represent on a day-to-day -day basis do it because they're passionate about the content that they're making. Yep. You know, and you can tell someone wants to make a podcast because they just want to make it a TV show. Or someone wants to do a podcast because they see the headlines and people are now making money. And I want to know at what point did that shift for you? At what point did you realize, oh, there's a real business opportunity? Well, it shifted when I met you. Right? I mean, so and this is an, this is an important point because Oren is really one of the, I mean, you won't read a lot about him and you won't see him everywhere, but I mean, six years ago, right, maybe seven, you reached out to me and said, hey, you were a very young, early, Back still, then, young, yeah, really. still young, but, but just starting out as a, an agent at UTA, and he reached out to me. And I, I, I wouldn't represent by lawyers who, who were very good, but you reached out and said, I think, you know, I think we should work together. And by that point, I had already left NPR. 
um, and was working with him as a as a collaborator. And he said, I think you know, I think I think I'd like to work with you. And I said, okay, knock yourself out. Because I, you know, it was harder than that. You weren't, you didn't give up that easy. But yeah, you know, but it was something like that. And I mean, you saw, you saw the opportunities, the business opportunities, um, and you really, you know, I mean, and 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 I should mention because I don't know the whole story, but internally at UTA, the response also was, yeah, whatever, knock yourself out. Right. Nobody really took it seriously right. six, six, seven years ago. Right. Right. Is that is that what happened? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I seven years ago, seven and a half years ago, when I came over to UTA, my my mandate was emerging platforms, which meant anything that we didn't figure out or didn't have a strategy or no one cared about, frankly, just go and, and get a sense of who the players are and should we what should we be doing in that space? And and podcasts was the tiniest sliver. Yeah, it was maybe five percent of what I was doing, and. To be honest with you, there was serial was that moment for me. Because what happened was I, I was listening to this thing, and by the third episode, it hit me, and I was like, this is an amazing piece of content. This is yeah. the only thing I want to do. I don't want to watch anything. I don't want to read anything. Yeah. Um, so that was the first thing. And then the second piece was everyone I knew was listening to this piece of content. Everybody. Everybody. Yeah. It was the only thing I wanted to talk about. Yeah. So I'm like, amazing content community, even if it's just the 10 people that I deal with every day. And then I couldn't fucking get MailChimp out of my head <laughs> because it was the only brand in the thing. I'm like, all right, well, someone is getting paid something, even if it's not a lot. So I'm, I told our CEO, like, I'm just going to go all in on podcasts. Like, podcasts? What is that? And I tried to explain to him, like, well, who would want to listen to a podcast instead of read a book or watch Netflix? Like, I don't know, but I think, I think people are going to do it. And at that moment, I dug in. And, and they, you know, no one stopped me from it, but it was never, you know, it was never anything other than, sure, go figure out podcasts. Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, I met you, and that's when I started realizing, again, there are people like you out there that care about what they're creating, that want to have an impact, but also are building brands, brands that I felt like could and, and will inevitably have massive value, you know? And, the founders that you interview obviously also saw that. Otherwise, they wouldn't give you right. three hours or four hours or five hours of their time. Right. Um, but the business of audio didn't exist when you started. Did not exist, right. In fact, I want you to spend a, a few minutes talking about, the, if you can, the conversation around monetization at NPR. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, back in, uh, in 2013, um, when, when we formally launched, relaunched TED Radio Hour, there was a, uh, I mean, the show was not, there was no advertising on the show. And I met a guy named Jeff Ulrich who ran, a, started a company called Midroll, Midroll Media. He eventually sold it. And Midroll Media was basically selling ads for podcasters, Mark Marin and, you know, people here and there. And he, he, he came to me, he, we met, and he said, you know, you're, you guys are really missing an opportunity to monetize this show. Now, what was interesting about that, and he showed me what he was doing with his shows. Now, what was interesting to me was not, wow, I can make a lot of money. And really, it wasn't, wow, I can make a lot of money making TED Radio Hour. That was not what I was thinking. I was thinking, why, why is NPR, which at that time, and I would still argue to today, making some of the best audio content full stop, why was it just giving it away? Now. Not, I'm not saying it shouldn't be free. It should be. But internally, there, wa there was this view that, like, you just make it and, you know, and, and hopefully it'll be self-sustaining. Maybe we can get funding from a grant or a foundation or something. But I thought, well, why can't we, you know, advertise around it in a way that is still kind of, you know, works with, with the values of the organization? Because this is valuable stuff. I, I felt like TED Radio Hour was content that was actually people wanted and needed and felt like it was value add in their life. And they were paying for other things. Right. So could we create an ad model around it? And so there was a lot of resistance internally because it, the, the, the response was, oh, you're a journalist. You're, you're going to be undermining your credibility if you're going to be reading ads. And in, in around 2013, I was mm -hmm. going to, you know, internally there and talking to people and saying, hey, we should really, 
we should be more aggressive about this. I should read ads. And people would say, that's, that's a terrible idea. You're going to undermine your reputation, your credibility. The audience is, is going to hate it. And then I showed people videos of Edward R. Murrow, the patron saint of journalists, reading ads in the 1950s. And I said, here's the patron saint. Here's the Joan of Arc of journalism, reading ads. Now, why do we do it? I'm not doing it because I'm, I love reading ads. I'm doing it because there's value in bringing revenue to what we do so we can create more. And it was a long, painful, torturous process. But eventually, um, because of a series of some people leaving and sure. <laughs> some things happening, um, we ended up doing it. And in fact, I had produced, with one of my producers, mock advertisements to play for the lawyers and other people there to explain that this could work. And eventually, we did it. And it really did work. Um, and it, it became a hugely important part of, of you know, a revenue stream for NPR. To this day, it is, because they make great content. And to make great content costs money. You need money to do it. And so how do you get the money is you have advertising. Mm -hmm. And so that really you know, was, was sort of the, the, the beginning of, of host red ads, which you know, they're still they still limit it um, there, but you know it's been a hugely important part of their growth. Right. Um, so you've been in audio for a while, early days, and again, it's really about the success that you've had was really driven by the the content itself and the creative, and many people I think see you, read about you, listen to you, and they don't really think entrepreneur, right? They think, this is someone who's a host of a show. Uh, I don't think they trivialize it. I just think they don't really think yeah. about the fact that you've started businesses, the fact that you created this idea that ultimately became, became a piece of content that's incredibly valuable. And I want to talk about sort of starting a company. And, and I want you to take us through Tinkercast, which is your kids and family studio. What did you learn from that? Yeah. Why did you start it? What would you share with the folks who want to be in this yep. business today? I mean, the first thing I would say is I don't really care if people don't know about my entrepreneurial side because it's not, you know, I don't talk about it. It's not that important. But yeah, I mean, I, I run two production companies. One is called Built It Productions, um, which is a, a co-producer of How I Built This, and we make Wisdom from the Top, and we're going to be making new shows this year. So we're really excited about that um, with, with Amazon and Wondery. Um, and the other is a company that I co-founded with two friends um, uh, five and a half years ago called Tinkercast. And really, it began with this concept of making a kid's uh, podcast called Wow in the World, which we do to this day. And we have several other shows now. We also work with Amazon Wondery um, to distribute our programs. We have a show called How to Be an Earthling and Who Went Wow. And we're launching other um, programs. We've got live shows. but. Um, you know, I, I, I think that for me, creating these, you know, being part and creating these companies was a, a, an opportunity to just kind of control your creativity instead of working for a bigger company that kind of says yes or no. This was a chance to say, actually, we want to make this. Let's try it. Mm -hmm. And it might not work, but it'll be really fun. And, um, and, and the beauty of audio, is, as many of you know, is it's not that expensive to make. I mean, of course, it depends on what you're making. If you're making a very intensive documentary that requires travel and lots of interviews, it's not cheap. But you can make good audio inexpensively. And, and with Wow in the World, with our kids' show, we are able to build an entire world in a black box. So um, has anybody heard that show here, Wow in the World? So it's a, it's a oh, have you heard it? Are you Wow in the World listener? Oh, awesome. Um, both of you? Oh, nice. Um, so we, you know, we wanted to make this cartoon for the ear, mm -hmm. this whimsical cartoon for the ear, but that was really rooted in hard science. So the show, I mean, when I was hosting All Things Considered, every weekend I would be interviewing scientists about their peer-reviewed study. So all we did was we took peer-reviewed scientific studies translated them for us and for kids, and then built a narrative around it. And 
I do it with my friend Mindy Thomas, and that's our name in the show. I'm Guy Raz, she's Mindy, but we built a whole world. Mindy is really the kind of the genius of the show and the, and the main writer. We built a world of like, we have a nosy neighbor named Dennis. We have a time machine. We have a giant pigeon named Reggie that we fly around the world on. We go underwater, we, but we are investigating real peer-reviewed science in every episode, but it's an adventure. And it's, a, as I say, a cartoon for the mind. Um, and it's a, it was designed to, to, to do that, but we really made it because we wanted to have fun. We didn't ever intend, we didn't know what would happen, and it became, you know, we were fortunate, it became a successful show. So, so that too, you got into the kids and family space because you just wanted to create something. For our kids, right. we wanted to create something that was a screen alternative. We wanted our kids to be able to imagine something visual in their mind that was as dynamic, as creative, as fun as a screen, as a, as a cartoon. But that essentially would be another option. And that, that's how it began. And then we began to discover over the last two or three years that this is a huge growing space. So right. we've built a company called Tinkercast. We've got live shows. We've got um, multiple books. We, had a, we have another book coming out in a couple weeks. Um, we've got uh, an ed tech platform that we've used our revenue to, to finance. So we have a whole team working on building a, a school curriculum around project-based learning using our science content. We've launched two other shows. Um, we've got you know merchandise and things like that, but it's a real business. I mean, there are you know we've got lots of people working there. Um, it's all distributed all over the country. We're all meeting uh, this week for a, a retreat. So that is a that is a model that we have, and you know we'll talk about other extensions, video and, sure. and others. It's a similar model with Built to Productions, um, and you know with what we can do with with some of the programs. High Built this was a book, too, and and live shows and a summit. Which, which, which you, you, you've been to, and so, um, so yeah. So, okay, you got in early with on-demand audio and TED Radio Hour, how I built this. You got in early in the kids and family space. Yep. What is, what do you see, whether it's for you or more broadly speaking, this industry, what is the, the evolution of yeah. this space? I mean, I think um, it's, it's always hard to, hard to predict and hard to know, right? I mean, what, I think that what we do know is this, Human beings can consume, can consume content in very limited ways, through our ears, through our eyes, by touching. So it's like you can read something on the printed page, you can see a still image, you can see a moving image, or you can hear something. Mm -hmm. That has never changed. That is like, like, that's like you know, early homo sapiens, like that we are the same exact, that's not changed. It's the delivery mechanism that changes. Right. So podcasting is basically the same thing as you know Neolithic man sitting around a, a fire telling stories. It's just coming through your smart speaker or your smartphone, and and so the delivery mechanism will change. Um, and what I think is exciting is that it's every single day it becomes cheaper to make. Right? I mean, to, uh, to get a really good microphone today, fifty, seventy-five bucks. I mean, I have a. A, a, a Neumann U87 that's $3,000 because that's just what the standard radio mic was for years. But I can just use a Rode podcast mic and make a show that sounds as good. It's a $200 mic. So the, the technology has enabled you know, so many people to make things and to put it out there. I think the, the question is, you know, um, where are there opportunities? Mm -hmm. I think there are opportunities, still think there's opportunities in business adjacent programming. I think there's huge opportunities in kids programming, obviously storytelling. Um, and, you know, and, 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 but there, um, you know, and there are, there are spaces and places where I think, you know, we will see um, a lot of innovation in how people tell stories. I think video components, I, if you ever watch if you ever see how Spotify uses video with some of their podcasts, I think that's really interesting. You know, you click the podcast and then it's a video. So obviously, uh, we know that a lot of podcasting is moving towards YouTube, um, and that's something that I think is really interesting. Will there be more visual components? You know, will be will people be watching podcasts right. more rather than just listening to them? So, well, as a I'm actually curious. So YouTube, we know, is getting the space. Yeah. Spotify, as you mentioned, yeah. has video as a big initiative. As a creator, are you like? Oh, video takes away from the experience and the intimacy of the conversation, or what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I don't. I mean, I, I mean, there is something very intimate about 
um, just talking to somebody you know, through your headphones, right? So something that most of you probably are not aware of is certainly throughout the pandemic, I have not interviewed a single person face to face. So if you listen to how I built this, and I know a lot of you probably know that because you're in podcasting, but a lot of people who hear me say that are stunned. How, how, how are you having conversations with people remotely? And how are you having such an intimate conversation mm -hmm. with people remotely? And my answer to that question is, you've all done it, especially if you're over the age of 40, which is when you were a child, you had a phone in your house that was connected to a long cord. And you walked around a corner, and you sat in a closet, and you had an intimate conversation with other fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. I have no idea what you're talking about. You don't, because you're yeah. too young. Yeah. But if you are my age or older, or young, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Those are the most intimate conversations you had in your life. On the phone, corded, even a cordless phone. You had them. And your mom would get on the phone and say, and you go, Mom, I'm on the phone. And your mom would go, oh, sorry, and hang up. Um, or, you know, and, and so that's the, it's the same right. thing. When you're in someone's head and they're in your head, you're focused, you're yeah. present. And, and being present is a gift that you give to somebody. If you can sit with somebody and actively listen to their life story yeah. and ask them questions about their life story, you are giving them a gift, and they will give you a gift in return, which is their story. You are being generous with your time and your attention, and they will be generous with their story and their deepest thoughts and feelings. And that's really it. That's really it. We have. I, I want to save some time for for some questions, but I gave you a lot of softballs. Okay. <laughs> um, and 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 yeah. Okay. And I'm gonna. I think everybody wants to know. If you could get one guest, who would that be? One dream guest. I would love to have a deep and meaningful and really um, in-depth, real, vulnerable conversation with, I think, a person who's widely believed to be probably the great, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, living uh, recording artist, which is Kanye West. He's challenging, I know, and, and has had some very challenging, but, but I don't think you can deny that his impact on popular music has been uh, almost peerless. And I think um, he's built an incredible brand and business, um, and I think it's worth hearing from him. All right, we've got to make that happen. Um, <laughs> Lenore, make a call. Uh, all right, let's do, let's do some questions from the audience. Yeah, any questions about podcasting, um, strategies, anything, please. And I'll stay after, too. Yep. Great. Perfect. Hi. Hi, Raz. My name is Rachel Toback. I'm a founder, huge fan of how I built this. Hi. My question for you is how, how much of your experience would you attribute to your skill <laughs> and the work that you've done, the hard work, and how much would you attribute to luck? <laughs> Thank you. This is, a, this is a very controversial question. And, and if I just used um, social media as a judge, I would say it's the most hated question that I ask. But I'm worried that if I stop asking, people are going to be like, why'd you stop asking that question? Yeah. Um, We're into and and, and the, the, the reason why I ask that question is because it's not really specifically for an answer. And every guest knows it's coming. I mean, I just talked to Max Levchin, and he's heard you know, half of the episodes of How I Built This. He knew it was coming, and yet after four and a half hours, he was just tongue-tied. He didn't know how to answer it. It's really interesting. It's, it's really designed to be like, we've just talked for four or five hours, three hours, usually. And now, we're, we, we reflect on your life. Tell me what you think, now that you've gone over your life story. That, so when I'm asking that question, it's in the context of this like big, broad, deep dive we've just had, this intense experience that we've had together. Now tell me what you think. And so it's, it's really just designed to, to kind of understand how their mind works and how they think about their own story. Um, in my case, of course, you know, I, I, I worked really hard. I was overseas and, 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 and grinded away and learned about the craft and got better at it over time. I was really bad at the beginning. It's like being a, a great 
basketball player. You're standing at the free throw line and you're missing everything the first five years. And then, then you start to sink some. And then eventually you, you start to sink most of them. And it's, it's like anything. Everybody who, does, who, who, who masters something is really bad at it at the beginning. All of us are. Everybody is. Except for Mozart, he was like three when he wrote his first. <laughs> but we're really bad at, some, at these things, right? And so it takes a lot of hard work. But it, of course, luck is a huge factor. I'm very lucky that Oren Rosenbaum heard, heard, heard my, my shows and liked what I did and wanted to work with me. I'm, I'm extremely lucky that you know, NPR took a risk on me when I was 25 to send me overseas. I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky that um, you know, I met the person who, who I've spent the last 22 years of my life with. Um, who's my, my wife and partner, and um, has, I don't think I would be able to do what I do without her intelligence and her, her input and insight. So I put a lot of, I, I, you know, call it luck, call it fate, call it God, whatever you want. I do, I do believe in it. Thank you. I'm just excited for the Kanye interview. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> you, no, you, right? you're going to do that phenomenally and that it kind of goes perfect into my question of just you talked about the polarization at the beginning and for me like in my youthful ignorance I've decided that there's just like a lack of empathy and like totally really like learned experience like actually understanding other people yes. and you have done a phenomenal job of really just taking people and breaking down their stories like we all know so I'm kind of just curious like how do we how do we amplify that like from your perspective how do we do that better as a society. Yeah, I mean, um, and some great, amazing people like Brene Brown and, and you know, my friend Celeste Headley and other people have talked about how do we have better conversations. Um, and I, I, my answer to that is a version of what I said earlier, which is to, to, you can listen to somebody. Like, we can go outside in the hallway and talk. And, and it can be fine, it can be perfectly fine, cordial. Or you can go to a party, and, but, but to really build that connection, you have to actively listen to somebody. You really have to just tune everything out. I can't be looking over your shoulder at somebody else coming. It's about you. It's about like creating a tunnel and really listening to what you're saying and asking questions and creating a, a feedback conversation. It's, it's, it's not hard. We can all do it because it's, it's an act of respect when you are focused on somebody's words and their face and their emotions. It's, it just requires concentration. And I do think that it's hard, because you know it's, you're developing a one-to-one -one connection with somebody. But I do think that, at least in my case, you know, I interview lots of people who I don't agree with, whose ideas I don't necessarily agree with. But I do think that there's value in, in virtually everybody that I talk to, because I'm trying to go into their, into their consciousness, into their brain, into their, the cockpit that they have, to understand how they see the world. Thanks. So. Thanks. Hi there, my name is Katie. Hi, Katie. Um, and I'm glad you failed early on because I'm a big fan of TED Radio Hour. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So, um, but I'm a journalist. I started out in local news and now I oversee, um, as a news editor, like a lot of what's going on in the world. And one of the things that I think about like every day is how do we tell stories differently? And I think the news industry as a whole is really thinking about yeah. that right now. And I love your, your path because you kind of have, have gotten to this space where you create connection really viscerally. And so I'm curious your thoughts on kind of the news and news industry at large, like how do we tell stories differently? What's missing? Um, how do we create connection when a lot of what's going on in the world feels like explicitly divisive? Um, but yeah, like, so that question, what's, what's missing from how we as media are telling stories? I think um, what, what, what was missing for a long time and what I think shows like The Daily really did successfully was figure out how to create a connection, that it's not like the voice of God telling you this is what's happening today. You know, I grew up watching Tom Brokaw, and Tom Brokaw was terrific. You know, we sat around and we watched it at 6 p.m. or 6.30, and that was the news, but it was very distant. It felt very far away. And I think that when people, and this is a challenge, I don't have the magic solution for this, but when people feel connected to the story somehow, when you can build that connection through empathy, um, it does, it does create more engagement. Um, 
you know, that being said, there are, as I say, there are, there are podcasts or places that are really trying to do this and experimenting with it. And I think that is an interesting, and I think that's where, in general, sort of the news business is heading. Um, but, you know, look, trying to tell a story objectively or whatever that, you know, that, that, that's meant to, to be is hard. It's hard work. And it requires a kind of a rethinking in general of this profession. And I think that it is evolving in a good way um, and in a way that I hope um, will bring people back to being engaged with serious, smart, good, high quality news content. So thank you. I think our time is is up, um, but I'm happy to stay around. And Oren, I'm sure you're yeah. happy to stay around. He's really the one you want to talk to. Not true. Not and true. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.